Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on our 25th episode of the spirit of the time and our going into our third season. Thank you guys so much again for being with us. We will get started right after the hour. Again, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us today. We are so excited to have Tony Baxter with us. We will get started right around 12 o'clock. For those of you just joining us, thank you again. We are so excited to have Tony Baxter with us today on our first flight of season three. This is our 25th episode, and thank you all so much for continuing the journey with us. We'll get started momentarily. For those of you just joining us, thank you so much. We will get started momentarily with Tony Baxter. Excited to have him join us for the start of our season three, our first flight. Welcome. <clears throat> Welcome to our first flight, season three, episode 25 with the legendary Tony Baxter. Thank you again for joining us on this Friday. We're going to get started momentarily.
Welcome to Zeitgeist Design and Production. I'm Becky Kiefer, Studio Director. Time travel is the ultimate immersive experience. VR, AR, and the metaverse all pale in comparison to the notion of sailing across the seas of time and space. Here in the Zeitgeist Creative Studio, imagination rules and time is always of the essence. This is where immersion artists Ryan Harmon and Jolan Cicero study the past and spend the present envisioning the future of location-based entertainment, or what we call UXIRL, user experiences in real life. Kicking off its third season and 25th episode today, the Spirit of the Time Zoomcast offers a sneak peek behind the themes. Each month, we move you without a ride system, inviting one incredibly talented and influential colleague aboard our time machine. We set the controls for milestone moments in that person's career and attempt to unravel the mystery of what makes a guest experience timely yet timeless. And because we're live, you can type questions into the chat box and our passenger will answer them after the journey, which today will last an extended 90 minutes. Climbing aboard our time machine today is undoubtedly the most celebrated and beloved theme park and attraction designer since Walt Disney himself, Mr. Tony Baxter. Over his 43 amazing year career as the first of the second generation of Disney's Imagineers, Tony's unrivaled creativity, intuition, leadership, and wisdom led to his spearheading such classic Disney attractions as Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Star Tours, the Indiana Jones Adventure, Splash Mountain, Journey into Imagination, and the Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage, along with overseeing the entire design of Disneyland Paris. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Time Machine pilots, Zeitgeist President and Chief Creative Officer, Ryan Harmon, and Zeitgeist Executive Vice President and Chief Art Director, Joe Lancicero, along with Disney legend, TEA Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Main Street Window Honoree, and IAPA Hall of Fame inductee, Tony Baxter. Hello, hello. Ryan, Ryan, are you there? Oh, hey, wow. how you doing? Wow, well, we, we just returned from Riverside, California in 1939, where we got to go to a screening of The Wizard of Oz. And why yep. is that important, Ryan? Well, it's uh, important because our guest today is a huge fan of The Wizard of Oz, as am I. And he actually owns the witch's time, whatever it's called, glass. The hourglass. Right? Hourglass. <laughs> Uh, right. from the movie and you know it's uh we always talk about what's timely and timeless on spirit of the time and the wizard of oz is a perfect example of something that was timely at the time because it had some of the biggest stars it was a you know family motion picture it introduced color um and here we are how many years later about 90 85 years later and it's still you it's know, relevant. It's timeless. Movies. Yeah, it truly it's is timeless. timeless. Yeah, so. that, that, because they're they're human themes that talk to all of us. You yeah, know, they're, they're human stories, and right. we're going to talk a lot about that today. With yeah, actually, our, where's Tony? Oh, yeah, where did, where is Tony? Wait, where is he? Da, 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 da. I don't know. I was back in 1941. <laughs> Forget 1939. Uh, I have a friend back there who's just uh, done another great adventure, which will be you'll all be seeing shortly. Yes, we're very and excited. Head out of this heavy, heavy jacket. <laughs> so, as you all can see, Tony also has a time machine. His is yes. a little better than Ryan and I's. And Anyway, we won't get into that, but Tony, welcome. And before we get into this, I, I just got to take a moment to thank you publicly because I, like so many other Imagineers, I owe my Imagineering career to Tony Baxter because he snatched me out of, out of feature animation, made me walk across the street and got me involved in what turned out to be a most amazing life journey. So I have to thank Tony for that as many as others have to do and all the great opportunities and all the great times we had along the way as well. Yeah. But I Joe, you have to tell them that I don't snatch everybody. I only snatch very talented people. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tony. 
I, I would also like to have a little tribute, Tony. I was about 22 years old when I met you as I was the youngest to Disney, uh, Disney Imagineer at the time. And you gave me a chance to work a bit on Euro Disneyland. And uh, Joe and I worked a bit on the, um, what was it, Joe? The uh, Mickey's Toontown. And I worked on the Winnie the Pooh ride and the Little Mermaid ride when it was a suspended vehicle. And uh, I've just learned so much from you over the years. In fact, I just wrote an article. And when we talked the other day, I realized that a lot of what I put in the article was stuff that I learned from you. <laughs> <laughs> so then we're what gonna... goes around comes around, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So we are so excited. Yeah, to we're have thrilled you today. to have you on today. Yeah. Tim. So so let's set the controls. I think we should probably go to about, let's go to 1954 when you're about seven years old and you're watching the Disneyland TV show on TV with Walt Disney a year before the park opens. You're up in Altadena, where I am usually. And uh, tell us what's going on. Well, you know, it's a black and white world in 1954. So yeah. um, I remember that year being indoctrinated actually to what was going to be a theme park a year later. But at that point, the word Disneyland meant the best TV show that took you to one of four lands every week. So you get to go to Adventureland, Frontierland, and so forth uh, with an episode that would really be a Disney product that would probably be found like Davy Crockett in Frontierland or Alice in Wonderland or the Man in Space programs in Tomorrowland. So uh, I didn't know it at the time, but my brain was being programmed so that the day that park opened almost a year later, I knew where to run, you know, we knew where everything great yeah. to be. It was like a brilliant, brilliant, um, I don't want to say marketing. Well, Walt was just to synergy. It was all about synergy and getting everything to reinforce all the other businesses that you have. And today you can look at that in Marvel with their Marvel universe and yeah. how it all ties together. So those concepts that Walt started have taken root in a lot of places. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so Tony, we're also around 1957, 1958, you were also watching some very seminal films. Yeah. You know, that was that was a time before all these these whiz bang special effects films that we have now. Yeah. Um, what what some of those films were and the effect that they had on on forming your creative thought. Well, I the one that you know I was only probably about nine or, or so and I saw it four times every week I'd go and it was un, unheard of for a film to stay in a theater more than a week it was three and a half hours long it was the ten commandments but it was so well executed from a universal audience perspective um, and that's kind of what I think in the theme park business we have to deal with or you're creating a product that's going to be narrow casted which you can't afford to do yeah. when it's got to stay there. So it, I think it was a seminal film to look at and say, uh, he ignored a lot of things that would have made it a prestige film, but he put so much into it that grabbed children. And I remember on my third week of viewing it and I'm sitting there with my charm pop and my big <laughs> popcorn and all this stuff. And the mother behind me with her kids was saying, oh, you know, I didn't realize this is over almost four hours long. And I turned around in my seat and I said, they're going to love it. Don't worry. You know, it doesn't matter it is four hours long. So, um, but, you know, the parting the Red Sea, the, the staffs turning into snakes, the burning bush, all of this stuff. There was nothing. I mean, we didn't have anything. Uh, I'd never seen anything like that other than animation, Disney right. animation. Um, this was like real. It looked like it was real. And yeah. so I just... I just thought this is a world that somehow, someday, I, I really want to try and be a part of it. And then then it started a slew of things happening because another genius in animation was someone who was um, an idol of mine was Ray Harryhausen. Mm -hmm. And actually the first Sinbad movie that he did was Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Uh, and I think it's the best. And, you know, yeah. we all have that problem that when we're 12, whatever we see that year stays the best for the rest of our <laughs> life. <laughs> right. Um, that one I do believe has a better story and the acting, which wasn't what it was all about, is ad adequate. And the dragon is a masterpiece. So, uh, but that only stayed my favorite dragon for one year. And then Sleeping Beauty came out uh, in 1959. Yep. The last five minutes of that movie are probably, I remember reading in a film, I went to a film uh, screening, a retro screening of it in 70 millimeter and 
the brochure said, never before and never since has a 70 millimeter screen been electrified with any action sequence as strong as the uh, fight with Maleficent as a dragon at the end of it. Wow. And as a result, I'm an Ivan Earl, who's the background and stylist for that film. I have become a devotee and half this house is filled with <laughs> relics of, of uh, Ivan's work. So yeah, wow, yeah those were all, those were my preteens. Once you're a teenager, other things in movies start interesting. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we set the control now to 1965. You okay. are 18 years old and it looks like- 17. I, yeah. 17. And yeah. you're, you're over here scooping ice cream on Main Street at Disneyland. Yeah, I What's tried to get, you know, your dream is I'm going to go out there and be a ride operator and I'm going to operate, you know, things like the Jungle Cruise and all these very theatrical, you know, roles. And you go out and they go, well, at 17, you know, the only thing we can offer you is scooping ice cream, you know, and you go, uh, I'll do it. That'll be fine. <laughs> because the real important thing wasn't the pitiful wage or anything like that. It was uh, a silver pass or main gate pass that yeah. got me and four people into the park. And back then there were no blockout days. It was like good every day. So uh, I lived there. I practically lived there. And yeah. that was after uh, from, you know, 12 years on, I think I, I was able to ride my bike out there and I could even do a little bit of, um, you know, so falsification with my parents saying, I think I'll go play miniature golf this afternoon. Can I have $2, you know? <laughs> and it, you can't believe for t five bucks, you could get admission and 10 rides, a lunch with a hot dog and a Coke, and then maybe have a 75 cents to a dollar for souvenirs all in wow. all, <laughs> five bucks. And so that, you know, the whole idea of, as soon as I get that job, I won't have to spend the five dollars. You know, I right. can uh, start making money and going to Disneyland too. Right. So that right. that was my entree into the world of Disney. Wow! Would you so, like a Fantasia cone? It's a combination of burgundy cherry, banana, and pistachio. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds absolutely horrid. I never actually, other than tasting it and deciding it was disgusting, I never got a cone of that. Oh, wow. okay. what was the cost of a cone at that time? Uh, that's an interesting thing. Here's a sidebar. They were 10 and 15 cents and they weren't making any money. So they, I was the most judicious and perfect with my ice cream scoops. <laughs> and so they said, get Baxter out there and have him scoop out one whole three gallon, you know, cardboard carton and count the number of scoops. And I think I got 58 scoops. So that was $5 and 80 cents in scoops. The right. carton of ice cream was like nine dollars, just in oh my <laughs> so, wow. so immediately from my uh, doing that exercise. The next week, the cones were uh, twenty-five and fifty. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's funny. That's a lot. Ice cream today doesn't even cost that much. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. Okay, for, for a five. I don't oh, know for a one. giant one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, wow. So what, what other attractions uh, did you work on when you were there? Well, the goal after getting that job was to get out of that job and get on the attraction. Right, so right. I transferred as quickly as uh, I could. And then I was assigned it to Tomorrowland, which I was very theatrical. And so the idea of working the submarines and being a pilot or the um, adventure through inner space and being like in a Star Trek movie only yeah. going into the micro world and you know you, you I, the flattery from guests saying this must be so incredible to come to work every day and get to do this you know and then yeah. as they get out of the ride vehicles going that was amazing you know let's go do it again yeah. and that that kind of fed your you know i got the credit i always thought it's like working in a bakery and ride operators are the people at the counter watching everybody enjoy the food somewhere in the back room is a baker sweating his <laughs> his body off, you know, making all these confections. Yeah. And I would later find out that was kind of the difference between working at Disneyland on the front line and taking the glory versus being somewhere in a, a factory creating rides, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's a very different experience. So during so this time, you, oh, sorry, Joe. No, I, I was gonna say, so around, around the same time, yeah. You were going to Cal Poly? I started at Cal Poly and, um, you know, having parents that wanted, 
their child to, uh, you know, I guess, honor them and be professional. They wanted me to be an architect. And so I started an architect. I found that very limiting. So somebody suggested landscape architecture and urban planning. That still sounded very um, professional in my parents, so they accepted it right away. <laughs> but again, I, I felt like I'm, I'm having to create to artificial rules and regulations rather than what I would like to do, which is using these skills as a painter would use paint, you know, rather than, well, you have to do this and, you know, and, and follow all the rules. And, and there are a lot of them in making profit from shopping malls and, and strip, you know, centers and all that, that make them very ugly just yeah. in order to make, you know, so you're driving along, there's a flower shop. You have to see that flower shop. It can't be in a quaint little thing we'd love to see it in where no everybody just passes by and go oh we got to get flowers for grandma you know that has to be a big neon sign out on the corner where you can <laughs> pull aside the road right. um anyway so one of my electives there was graphic design and i started working on an idea for a mary poppins thing just to inspire me to do the graphic art and um the guy said you know have you ever thought about going into art and he was saying something my parents would have just killed me you know for especially during the hippie era this was during you know the late 60s and uh, but it it rung true to me i knew that that would be the release that i wasn't getting out of these more confined and gentrified professions so i switched to long beach state and i landed with a mentor dr maxine merlino who later went on to be the dean of the art department there and she retired joe to madrid Spain where oh. you are right now and I visited it there I visited with her when she was having her 100th birthday there in Madrid Amazing. and she was in perfect wow. health we went up and down the stairs to restaurants all this stuff so um but it's really important I think to get a mentor that is very sensitive to how to turn you on um and so she realized that me doing the opera turando with the rest of the class would be a disaster for me and she said, well, what is it you'd like to do? And I said, well, I'd like to design a ride for Disneyland. And um, she said, well, that's not theater. And I said, well, I kind of think it is. I think the, the word theater is changing and will continue to change based on the technologies that we have at our disposal. And so she had never been to Disneyland. Wow. And I got her out there on my silver pass from <laughs> Skip the Train. Yeah. And, uh, she fell in love with it. I think she shot 25 rolls of Kodak. Oh, wow. film, and she said, I've got more, um, you know, what do you call it, details here uh, for architectural treatments and than I've ever amassed in trips all around the world. And they're all here <laughs> in these 60 acres or whatever. It's because this is just phenomenal. So uh, it was a mentoring to me is a two way where obviously you're getting something as a mentee, but I think in this case, it, was, it became apparent to me for the first time that the mentor realized uh, to be valid and, and uh, in, in a changing market, she needed to also learn from the, the next generation down. I mean, yeah. and she had students that like, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but he was the art director on all the star, Mike Miner uh, on the Star Trek films. And she'd bring out Mike's art and she said, okay, this is what I expect. And he was like a year ahead of me and we're going, okay, there's no way we're going to ever, ever be this good, you know? And uh, so she pushed us, she challenged us, but she knew by giving you the chance to do something you really loved, you'd exceed what you'd do if you were, well, I've got another week, so I'm not going to start on that Turando project until Friday night. And then it always, the, the bad thing about art is we can't cheat the way that if you're tired and miserable, you can still pound the uh, the keyboard to get out an essay, but with art, you know, there's no way you can make it look good if you feel like, you know, crap and the, and the whole thing is just not inspiring you at all. It'll, it, you know, it, it is your mind that comes out on the paper. Yeah. You can see right through that. So, um, that was really the, the moment that I think I got more confidence that this career could be a possible thing. Yeah. And was that the Mary Poppins ride that you designed? No, I had done that for the guy at uh, Cal Poly. Oh. And it was rather amateurish. 
Um, I'm missing a few gaps here, but I took that into Disneyland and they go, well, you know, I would suggest you continue with your schooling, you know, and get better at art. And, yeah. and that was right when I transferred over to the art area. So I had been following when I was a kid, I would get the Disney, I got one share of Disney stock, which got you the annual report every year. Yeah. And back when it was a beautiful piece of um, yeah, remember, bookmaking. Yeah. Yeah. There was a page that said dreaming and it would show all the movies that they were thinking about and the new rides that weren't out yet. So for 35 bucks or whatever the stock was, you got tickets to Disneyland every year. You got to see a movie that wasn't out and you got oh. pictures of what the company was going to do. Wow. And, uh, so in there was Island at the top of the world. Had no idea. It was a Peter Ellen Shaw rendering about this big and, the, <laughs> and I had my magnifying glass. <laughs> I, I said, okay, I'm just going to make it up. So it, as it turned out, I thought, I think I made up a better story than the movie ended up turning out to be because yeah. that would ultimately sink the whole idea many, many years later because the movie didn't uh, perform. But anyway, I, I, it, I was very excited about uh, a journey that would take you. Pirates had just opened, which redefined um, the what a theme park e-ticket adventure could be. And so I went further than that. I thought, it's not just going to be pirates. You're going to a whole lost civilization um, that has its own architecture and its own creatures and everything. Um, and so it was probably, I don't know how you'd equate it in today's dollars, but billions, you know, yeah. uh, so it was not a practical thing. But when you're a student, you just think everything, you could do anything, you know, you, you don't, you're not exposed to the other side of it, which is, you know, the, the school of hard knocks. Right. Wow. So let's fast forward. Where it's a historic day. We're here in Glendale. It looks mm -hmm. like we're at the 1401 building and you're driving your car around mm -hmm. the back to the model shop with something in there somebody wants to see. What's well, my dial has stopped about a month before that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> I went up for my interview and um, they looked at my artwork, which was adequate. You know, it wasn't Herbie Ryman, it wasn't Mark Davis or Claude Coates, it was adequate. And yeah. they get that, okay, is there anything else? You know, and you kind of get that feeling. They didn't really, you know, go, oh my <laughs> God, this is unbelievable. And I brought in the car, a thing that I'd just been doing as a kid for years, I'd been refining it and refining it. It was an outgrowth of not having the money to do the ultimate railroad train set. So I bought balsa wood, um, little square, quarter inch two uh, rails of balsa wood and glued it all together with hot melt glue and rolled marbles down it. And then as that got, you know, falling apart, I converted it all over to walnut wood that I custom milled to quarter inch squares <laughs> and, uh, and then steel that I was welding at Long Beach State. Oh, and I had this thing that looked kind of like a three dimensional small world facade with all these steel ball bearings, which had a lot of weight and could do a lot of action. So I could make music boxes play and cars roll down tracks and everything just with the weight, the gravitational weight of the thing. And so it, it was this big performing thing with pinwheels and stuff flying around. And, and I had it out in the car because I didn't, there was no way I could carry it in the building. And so after I got the, yeah, okay, is there anything else? Or are we done? You know, and uh, I said, well, yeah, if you could walk out to the car. And there it was in the back and the guy's eyeballs kind of popped out. He said, do you think we could pull this around the back? And um, I said, yeah, you mean I get to go into Imagineering where <laughs> our house is? And as we yes. did that, you know the area, Joe, and, and Ryan, uh, yeah. you know, there was haunted mansion vehicles going around on a test track and oh. pop-ups <laughs> of the graveyard going up and down. And the Western River model was there. Oh. And and we're carrying my thing in and I'm, I, I could care less about that. I'm going, <laughs> if, I, if, it, if nothing ever happens from this, at least this was worth being up here. And <laughs> so then I played it and it took five minutes to run. And then all the people that were gathered around would go back to their offices and they'd say, you've got to go down to the model shop. There's this kid that's brought this thing in. It's amazing. So that was about two in the afternoon and at five o'clock, I was still doing these tours and <laughs> for a year after that people would come out to the shop where I, when I was hired and they'd say are you the guy that brought in that thing you know like oh that was amazing you know so I became known for that and I think 
the lesson I learned out of that, of course, you don't know it at the time, was um, you you have to have something else in your back pocket to make you more valuable than the 90% of the people that are also applying for the same illustration or right. model building thing. And while we were doing Shanghai, I told to all the people that were asking me how you um, get into something like this. I say, you do your best at whatever you majored in, whether it's writing or art or you know architecture. And then at the end of the interview, you say, oh yes, and I'm fluent in Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Is that you one more thing? Say, thing. Uh, because they're gonna say, we well, have 40 people, they're all kind of experienced and good, but we're gonna be over there in this foreign market and we don't have to deal with a translator. You know, which yeah. means the creator is dialoguing with the client directly. Right. So it's things like that that you have to look beyond the uh, obvious thing that you've trained for, or you think you're applying for, that lift you out of that pack of, you know, twenty or thirty applicants for the role. Yeah. yeah. So Tony, did Tony, how, how did you find out that you were actually hired there? <laughs> Okay, that's why I wanted to spin the time machine back. Yeah. <laughs> we had that great meeting up there, and I came back to Disneyland and put on my Adventure Through Inner Space suit and felt like Spock or Captain Kirk, you know. And um, then I took that the day after the New Year's weekend between season 69 and 70, I took it in to get a new fresh costume on um, the end of the weekend there. And the guy pulls a card and says, Oh, we're supposed to take your costume. You're, you're no longer working here at Disneyland, which was like frightening uh, because you transferred up to Imagineering and I had heard nothing. So, you know, the, the scared part was I've lost my job at Disneyland and nobody's called me at Imagineering. So I drove up, get in the lobby and they call someone and I'm all in a suit and tie. And they say, oh, we had no idea. We thought maybe in three weeks or so we'd, get you in here but you're here so why don't you just go to work so i go into the back and uh, i meet with somebody and there's a model of the hall of presidents uh for walt disney world beautifully done the curtains worked and lighting and all that but it was framed in raw plywood and so this guy brings in a black sinclair flat black paint and a roller and a pan and he says here's a smock and uh, you put it, put that on because you've got your good clothes and everything. We want you to take this whole plywood around the model and make it black, you know. So I'm doing it. And about a half hour into this, I went, yesterday, I was at Disneyland taking people inside the center of an atom. And I looked like a movie star in that outfit. And today I'm rolling paint on a black wall. And I thought maybe this was not the right decision I don't know. Uh, so that was the beginning yeah wow so i learned i had a job at imagineering from the window checkout at disneyland costuming that was and they didn't negotiate salary or terms or oh, well anything. after i yeah after i i think uh, i was actually at work yeah i got a 50 percent raise from Ooh. disneyland to um, going there now get this two dollars at disneyland three dollars at Imagineering yeah <laughs> the big box <laughs> and the driving from Orange County more than took care of that all oh, right <laughs> yep wow so what other projects did you get to work in you were on the Magic Kingdom the second Disney park ever built that's pretty awesome yeah so uh <laughs> the, the key to that was finding the difference between people you work for and people people that you work with and Mark Davis was one of probably the most talented uh, Imagineer with handling audio metronics and staging scenes that read visually that yeah. don't depend on dialogue. Because I think one qualm I have about everybody in this business, they try to write scripts for these rides. And you're lucky if you get three or four words or you right. care to listen to three or four words. And when you look at Mark's, the one I always use is the 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 pirates in jail with a dog and the keys. You, yeah. You, yeah, you can hear them going, here, buddy, come on, and whistling. Right. But it doesn't matter. You just look at it and you know, oh, look at how funny that is. The, the pirates are trying to get that dog to let go of the keys. Yeah. And Mark always, I think that was the thing I learned from him. And you can't learn it because it was intuitive to him. 
right. and all the rest of us are struggling and we do we cheat like the thing i can't stand is in more recent paintings you have guests in the foreground pointing going oh look they're going, ah, isn't that funny and they're they're telling what you should be able to just looking at the painting you should get that feeling you don't right. need this boat with all these people pointing and everything so um you know we've got to I think that that was what was great about Mark, but Mark was, you work for me and you bring back the work to get it approved. Like, yes, that's the right color. I think you have moved it too far this way. I really want it over there. And a lot of people are very comfortable with that because it's a secure thing. And if you're talented in a, a, a skill, um, working for someone like that can be um, comforting because you don't have to make a mental decisions. Now, Claude Coates, who was the opposite of Mark. He was a background and color stylist with Mary Blair on all the animated films. And Claude, um, when I started working with him, you know, on Snow White Ride for Florida, he would say, well, why don't you take it back to your desk and draw a couple of things and then bring them back and we'll see which one looks good. And I'm going, oh my God, this is going to be in the Snow White Ride, you know. The spider web is so important and I've got to get all the little, you know, spirals just right so it doesn't look contrived, but it doesn't look too messy. And finally I took it in and of course to Claude, it was a secondary item in the importance of the witch and the cauldron and all that. So he goes, yeah, 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 that's fine. Now go do this. And what I started to realize is where to put your focus and what, you know, energy you need to, you know, you know, I had spent, I was like, you know, literally boiling in the stomach, worrying about the spider web. And, you know, uh, I realized later that it's the whole scene and that's where Claude was brilliant. So in terms of not the getting the kind of things, the details that Mark would focus on, but Claude would put um, the presentation in a situation where it's enchanting or amazing to look at and it, it's all balanced and um creating composition and so forth. So mm -hmm. he and I clicked because I didn't want to work for someone. I wanted to work with someone. And he would learn from me. He would, he had, he was the designer for inner space. And he, you know, uh, I didn't know that. He didn't tell me till after he had said, so what, what do the guests think of that ride down there? And I mean, I could have gone off on several different approaches that that man they really love that ride you know but uh i was you know in fact i remember there was a guy behind him saying say yeah say say that you like it you know and i did and i really loved working it so i was pretty uh, forthright about my feelings on it but it definitely was our answer to psychedelia in the 60s and um but you know claude was curious what younger people thought of something he would be in his late 60s probably uh, was very curious about what i and uh, and i was 22 um what i thought about it you know so out of that we became friends and i would go over to their house he was an academy member and he'd say why don't you spend the night in his son's old bedroom and uh me and my wife will take you down to the academy and we'll but they didn't have screeners then you'd go and watch the films I... so i went how is this happening to me? I'm a kid in Santa Ana up here with this guy whose name is on all the films. I'd love watching Lady and the Tramp and all the, the Alice in Wonderland and backgrounds or color styling by Claude Coates. And, you know, he was now a friend. And right. we were generationally, he was as old as my parents. And um, he came over to my house and I was living in my parents' <laughs> home in my upstairs bonus room of the track we were in. And, uh, the Claude comes into the house and then meets my parents, but then goes up the stairs to look at all my kid junk, you know, and, <laughs> and it just seemed so, uh, I was, I, I realized I have to get an apartment now. I have to get out. Of <laughs> this is just too embarrassing. But anyway, he sent me to Florida and you're now thrown out there into being 22 years old and, uh, having to, you know, train and work with craft trade crafts that have no theatrical skills at all they're right out of the in florida they were all out of the building trade so you had lathers plasters electricians everything they didn't know how to build atlantis or the frightening forest or any of that stuff so um what i learned very quickly was to pick up the trowel or pick up you know a paintbrush and start doing it and you'd see them respect you from that if it looked good they were kind of amazed and then there was the other 
the end of it where sometimes you do the best you could and it looked terrible, you know, and I just grab the paintbrush and say, look, that didn't work. I'm going to paint this all out and we'll start again, you know, but for the most part, I uh, recognize that uh, even though we came from such diverse worlds, it was a whole good old boy quality, the you know, construction back and forth at that time. And uh, it was not, you know, the, the coming out of college in California, uh, it was it was a kind of culture shock, but um, I made a lot of really good friends there because I think the breakthrough is not standing back and being afraid to get dirty or spill the paint or, you know, get cement on your hands, which cracks your skin to death once you the lime and it destroys your fingers. But um, that seemed to work. And uh, then, you know, I was still literally a dimensional designer. I was assisting Gabe Burkhardt on the 20,000 Leagues ride, and I was help, you know, installing Claude's Snow White ride. And then I got word that uh, there was problems with the toad attraction. And I went in there and they said, see if there's anything you, you can look at. And they painted the whole outdoor segment as though it was bright afternoon. Well, if you know anything about dark rides, you know, you've got about 18 feet before you hit the ceiling. So if you have a blue sky going up to a line where it's suddenly a blacked out a ceiling with all the lights hanging and everything that looks fake it looks stupid it's why the camera on a set would crop just below the top so that your mind says well the sky goes on up there but a dark ride it doesn't so after studying i decided we need to paint it as so it was night so i took a segment of uh, the town square and uh, it was a big gamble because i was painting out all the scenic work that had been done in california where we have I think Grosh Studios and various other scenic houses had painted the full size and shipped it to Florida. So I was in there, 22 years old. You know, I had done some sets for Long Beach State, you know, in theater. And so I painted out a segment of it with Lee Toombs, Leota in the in the ball in the Haunted Mansion. And she was a great artist. And so the two of us, we painted this guy out and I, put, I left a little bit of airbrush blue from the original like down at the horizon line so that, you know, it started like the sun had set and then it it lost into blackness before we got to the 18 foot cutoff. Then I took the tree, which had all these bright green leaves and had to spray it all out and then illuminate a few of the leaves from a street lamp that I had the staff shop build. And then we painted it so as it was turned on and then the glow on the tree, you know, was reflected from that oh. fake light. Right. And so then all the powers came in and they had that. And then the 90% of the room that was as originally done. And there was no question. It solved the problem and you weren't looking up at the ceiling and all of that. So I was given the art direction, you know, Roly was the art director on that, but I was told do whatever you need to do to fix the ride wherever we've got that, you know, daylight condition. So the ride, uh, and I believe Disneyland has always been in the dark. Uh, so I don't know why the thought was to make it, you know, bright day and uh, on the road to no nowhere in particular. But anyway, so we repainted the whole thing to be a night show and uh, the rest is history. I came back kind of with a feeling I graduated from being an assistant to designers to being someone that was regarded as you can depend on him to get you out of a mess if you've got a problem, you know. I even had to go over and repaint the, the rocks in the jungle, which was Mark Davis's show, the you know, Jungle Cruise. Yeah. But, so, but again, Mark being a cartoonist, he thought, let's try blue rocks over here and how about pink rocks over in this area? And the jungle is too realistic, you know, and, and even though his animals, the, the bathing elephants and whatnot are, are definitely moved towards um, animation, they still look realistic. And yeah. so against a pink or a blue rock, uh, that was Dumbo time, you know? And so yeah. uh, I went out in the boat with Tom Radowski, who was at Walt Disney World, um, just learning the trade too. We were both probably, uh, you know, in, in our early twenties and we had waders on and we, poured buckets of burnt umber and you know over the the water the rock works and then and then took a hudson sprayer and let it drill down and aged all that down and then we had to be out by about 9 45 before the ride opened you know to the public and so those are the kind of jobs that you know 
it wasn't someone telling you what to do other than we don't like what it looks like fix it you know yeah you're an artist you figure out how to fix it yeah so you so you learned that your craft from being in the model shop in the shop and then you're thrown out in the fire yeah Yeah. you learn from the masters yeah and there's like no one there to you're (laughs) dealing with painters that are like literally house painters and so you're making it up as you go along and fending out the the thallo blue and uh, burnt umber thrown together and let to drill down make these amazing uh, uh things that look like algaes and whatnot growing on the rocks and the wow. term chuck and moss took on new meaning to me when i realized that meant you filled a buck an empty paint bucket with sawdust and then poured color into it and then got a big ball like a spitball or a a, a snowball and threw it at the rocks you know and it <laughs> stop it would break and there'd be little spatters and a big one and you do about three different colors like that and you've got like what looks like mosses growing all over the rocks rather than these fake now i can't watch any movies including the ten commandments without <laughs> seeing the chuck moss and the splatter paint and all the stuff that i learned yeah. when we we're doing that. yeah that's great so, tony, tony while we're on the subject of the jungle cruise tell us why it's the best vr ever mm-hmm especially in california yeah. the word vr to me and v what's the new one um uh, ar um, ar yeah. yeah too many of these things yeah. ar vr um it's AI. <laughs> yeah overused because if you think of the jungle cruise if we turned the water off uh within probably six months everything would be dead and you'd have what would be essentially a, a mediterranean or a desert climate there so everything that it's been created in the 10 acres there is artificial. And so to me, it's an artificial reality of the most believable kind. I mean, I think the the new announcement from Apple is going to be a, a novelty that we're all going to try. But ultimately, you know, the fact that you're trapped in this box and there's other people that are projected into it is not as satisfying as being with those people right and you're all in the 30 of you sitting in that boat and there's an elephant right there you're all looking at that elephant you're all reacting to that elephant you're all getting wet by Schweitzer falls the hippos are attacking the boat um here it was 1955 and walt was so ahead of that that term didn't need to be um created because he just did it Yep. And it's virtually real, isn't it? Yep. I mean, it's for all intents and pur- purposes, it's there. But in Anaheim, it can't exist. There's no way without human intervention that that experience can exist. And so we've, we've really categorized VR and, and a, or artificial AI is the other one coming. Boy, are there some cool things in that world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, but but I think we've got to broaden that perspective to say, ultimately, if you can create virtual space in the real world, yeah. it's always going to be higher than everything else. And even going a step further, you know, why are the pirates compelling when it's a 50 year plus old show uh, with rather early audiometronic process? I think there's something about the artificiality of it the artificial realness of it that's more captivating than if you watched a film from 1967 you know so i i I look at that i i know we've run through our film products in the parks last about two to five years uh and then people are tired of it because um there's an artificial reality in film but it's something that we can do now in our homes with it and we can you know, stream it. We can do so many ways. So it's value in a theme park or a, a venue setting is, is less precious than, you know, to, to sit in a room and hear about Williamsburg versus go out into Williamsburg with all the costume characters and everything, creating a virtual reality. Yeah. There's no comparison to that, you know? Right. So, um, I always put those virtual experiences like the jungle cruise at the top of the food chain. And that, you know, I've done Oculus and we've had a lot of fun with it. And somebody broke one of my beautiful glass chandeliers by oh. spinning their sword. And the, <laughs> you know, but uh, anyway, you know, I, I, you know, ultimately you come back to it's trying to approximate um, reality. So the yeah. closer you can get to reality, it shouldn't be defined by it's this or it's you know whatever variant there is. It's going to be just 
how effective you are in creating an altered universe that you can't see without the help of the creators. Yeah. Like Walt. Walt was the ultimate artificial environment creator of yeah. all time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell you, when you, when you mentioned Schweitzer Falls, I remember yeah. as a kid, you know, it wasn't, you were, you know, first off, you get to see the backside of water. Ha ha ha. Yeah. But it was, it was, like you said, the mist on your face, but there was also a smell that was kind of, yeah. This, yeah. Um, kind of mossy, you know, musty smell. So I mean, it was, it totally enveloped all of your senses, you know? Yeah, that's right. I can't walk through Adventureland to this day without getting pangs of hunger from the bar Bengal barbecue there, you know, with those skewers of uh, barbecue beef. And then the, they have asparagus wrapped with bacon, the grilled there. <laughs> yeah. and, ah, you know, it's like, and like you said, that's, a good amount of the experience, you know, that and the sounds. I mean, they say that in that jungle, there are the ant sounds from uh, them, the movie, you know, going, ee, 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 ee. Oh, really? oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, it's unique to that, you know, when I finally looked at the movie again, I went, oh, yeah, those are the jungle crews, <laughs> whatever they are, bugs or whatever in the background. Right. And, you know, those are all library sound effects back then. Disney couldn't, you know, didn't have the wherewithal to, in one year, build the park and then have all these <laughs> miscellaneous things. So they just go, yeah, those sound really creepy and weird. And so, you know, they put that out in the jungle. And as a kid, you know, those that's all virtually real. You know, I wasn't looking for the speakers. It was just something to intensify. These are tropical plants like you might find at the Arboretum, but the Arboretum wouldn't put all those sound effects to deepen the uh, artificial reality of it. And yeah. they would have hippos that come up out of the water. So, you know, Walt was a master at, uh, combining everything, including the sense of smell or, I mean, you know, there are connoisseurs of fans who can give you where the water came from at Disneyland because they have uh, pirates, you know. <laughs> wow. And I have to admit, I, this is terrible to say, but I can tell you Calico Mountain water. <laughs> if I was, wow. the minute I smell that big waterfall in the middle of that ride, it's yeah. literally, it's got a distinctive, you know, thing. So all of that is working on putting our brains at ease with something that is totally contrived, you know, there's yeah. no. Well, now there's even candles you can buy. Yeah, yeah, fire and water. <laughs> Pirates, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, that's okay. nutty. <laughs> so about 1975, I was about eight years old, walking through Disneyland, Main Street, Preview Center, and there's this awesome model of this new land called Discovery bay that's going to be built behind fantasy land with this big airship and all these cool things but year after year the model's still there but i don't see any construction going on are you bragging about yeah. being eight years old <laughs> no but, but but like what i what thought time machine people don't have to worry about aging they that's true that's they want, you know. but tell uh, us about discovery bay one of the well, great disneylands that never happened i started that with uh I already told you a bit, a bit about doing it for Long Beach State. And so yeah. the ride, Islands Off the World, was the centerpiece of Discovery Bay, um, was created for Dr. Merlino at Long Beach State. And I got a grade on it. And then I thought, well, what the heck? I'll just put it in as the lead uh, ride. Now, I'd learned a lot uh, before. Uh, oh, good. We can see this here. I'd learned a lot working at uh, Disneyland, you know, and, and, um, from when I did the initial thing. So I, I realized um, the idea that I had for a pirate ride would be redundant. Uh, it was sort of a Viking boat that took you to the um, head, at top of the world. And I, I thought, let's change that and do it as an airship. Because one thing I learned at Disneyland, and it's, it goes without saying, if you ask the guests what they prefer to do on any of our attractions, it's to fly. I mean, yeah. you look at the popularity of soaring, that violates the thing I just told you about movies running, you know, running out of steam faster. But the right. fact that you're clearly aware you've been lifted off the ground up into space uh, overrides that to a great degree. So it was planned to center around this dirigible uh, that was um, presented in the film in not a very creative way. But um, we literally took you to an alternate universe and altered, altered reality than the movie where you were going to find a civilization civilization that was buried under a dome created by a volcano 
that was able to heat enough to create a space. And then the dome igloo over it, you know, uh, was right at the point where the heat dissipated enough to freeze this crust. And so we managed to get in there by following these whales. And I'm getting into a story here that'll take all night. <laughs> um, and there is a civilization where all these creatures that are just mythical, like unicorns and griffins and everything live in there. And they're all alive. And the captain is going to do what all in every great science fiction movie does and fails at doing it, is going to capture one of these things and put it on board so we can prove when we get back. But to do it, he gets too close to the volcanic uplift and we get into a spiral lift that takes us up to the high point of the ride. And then it was kind of a free fall descent through oh. a storm getting back to Discovery Bay. And wow. uh, as we exited, they, we had a little automatronic post scene where um, the creature, he did manage to get it back. And so it's on the captain's shoulders and it's kind of a little dragony thing, you know, with a old bearded captain so that keep that thought in mind because yeah uh That's not no great ideas ever die you know <laughs> right. uh, bearded old guys with little dragons on their shoulder yeah um, <laughs> thing that goes on for me yeah so that was the centerpiece and it was sort of built around uh big thunder being the biggest gold discovery ever in the history of the united states and jason chandler a character that we created had discovered the gold and realized if I expose it, uh, the gold standard will be ruined. So we've got to only disperse a little bit of gold at a time. And uh, we proposed introducing the land as a TV series, a six-parter, um, where the first episode would have been uh, Jason Chandler getting the gold from Big Thunder, being laughed at for saving all the uh, doomed miners that were trapped in the avalanche in there. Uh, and uh, but he, when he found the goal, he realized I'm going to create a place where dreamers, like all of us creative folks, who get laughed at and told their ideas are stupid, they can come here to Discovery Bay, and we will indulge them because I have all the money in the world to fund all these research projects and trips to uncovering lost civilizations and so forth. So it was a cornucopia of rides and attractions that we could build and they'd be introduced with an episode. I was using the Walt Disney playbook for Disneyland. Uh, each week, a Discovery Bay Chronicle would take you to one of these adventures. And the first being the, the search for the Nautilus with Kirk Douglas. And he was at that point, I was around when he had the stroke, but he was you know, functional. And, and I thought that would add to it that he was, an old guy that nobody listened to, which is what Jason liked to find people that had great stories that nobody cared about. And uh, so Jason and, and Douglas go off for the Nautilus because he knows where it was last. He saw it sink. So they get there and it turns out the Nautilus was musty and mildewed, but watertight. And the first shot, stunning shot of the skeleton of Nemo with his hand on that lever that opened the window and they scrape off the all the barnacles and stuff and there's that skeleton looking out the window oh wow they float it back to discovery bay and all the secrets are on all this parchment in the tubes and everything in the books and so they're able to reconstruct what was probably nuclear energy and that becomes the dynamo that builds the uh you know the uh, technology for all the adventures in Discovery Bay in the following episode. So, of course, then the movie Island at the Top of the World, which was in production kind of while we were doing this, hoping that it would be great. Yeah. Instead, they hired David Hartman as the lead actor and they put a poodle in it. And oh. they met all these Nordic people who had to translate their dialogue. So this movie slowed to a crawl while uh, an English speaker said, you know, tell them where is the leader and then the, the next translator guy would go uga 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 then the guy would go gaga 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 and then then he would say he says we need to go over there okay we'll tell him well that kind of a movie just becomes a nightmare in terms of you know uh the slowness of and it needs to be an adventure so yeah. movie didn't do well and instead of realizing probably we didn't create the best um victorian wannabe of 20,000 leagues, they just sort of came to the conclusion that it says that guests don't want what I've got back here. Uh, you know, the Jules Verne fantasy is not relevant to people today. So that was sort of the sad ending. But like I said, things don't go away. So um, 
characters and sets and ideas for Discovery Bay have landed as far around the world as Paris and, and uh, in Tokyo, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. And yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, the, the, the DNA of what you did is so so prevalent in in uh, the the worlds they created in Tokyo and the um, the whole Nemo land. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which yeah. you did with, uh, with the Tomorrowland in in Paris. So yeah, yeah. and we had uh, we had we had done Disney Sea for Long Beach here in California, and so oh, yeah. the whole Volcania centerpiece was a part of the uh, project there, and. Uh, Oriental Land Company is just the smartest group of people. And, you know, Long Beach and the Coastal Commission and everybody was, wah, 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 you know, and uh, it just became overwhelming. And we had, you know, bought the Queen Mary and we were really committed to doing it. But, you know, you can't fight through the bureaucracy, whereas the Tokyo people looked at the project and they said, well, if you're not going to build it there, we want it, you know, yeah. and then they actually plussed it. Yeah. Because every time they do an attraction, uh, you know, like Winnie the Pooh is quantum's better over there. Yeah. Uh, and Splash Mountain, I'm glad that one is staying because it's the best one we ever did. Thank you, Joe. I think you were involved in that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, Tony, uh, it, it's 1979. We set the time machine. And probably, again, one of the, the quintessential Disney attractions now exists in every part of the world, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Yeah. Well, I got ahead of myself there and that actually Big Thunder kind of came to life right after I got back from Florida. Uh, those of you in this industry know that when a big job that's risky is completed, the first thing that happens in the creative organization is to cut costs. So it was like a game of musical chairs at Imagineering where who's going to have a chair when the music stops. Yeah. And uh, because I'd gained the confidence in Florida to be my own boss, I started working on a ride, you know, and I knew that the word was running through the building in about 1973, four, that they're not going to do um, the uh, Western River ride, which was a magnificent variation on pirates using cowboys and Indians rather than um, townsfolk and uh, pirates. And there were a lot of things happening. Um, the public was saying, don't, if you have the choice, don't go to Walt Disney World because the pirate ride is such a extraordinary attraction don't go to florida because they don't have it oh. and um we were planning that you know western river would be every bit as extraordinary as pirates but in that moment of like oh my god the, the park isn't working what are we going to do the easy fix was let's just build a pirate ride but we'll do a less quality one will take about a third of it. i think it's only seven or eight minutes the one in california is 15 wow. so go figure um wow. Yeah, so uh, it has a great queue. I will tell that, you that, yeah. that Florida has a great queue, better than California. But uh, yeah. the ride with the blue, you know, there's a psychology in that ride. Maybe we'll get onto that later. But you know, to me, it's not a story, and, and that I'll save that for later. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah. So I realized we've got to put something in the space where Western River is going to go. I certainly didn't want to say it's not going to go. So I figured out how to put Big Thunder out there and separate it from uh, Mark Davis's Western River ride. So in my first model, I put on the Western River building and then Big Thunder. And I said, we could go ahead and build this. And then when the money is right, we can put that on and they work together rather than being one, one space. And so uh, that intrigued everybody. And I said, well, what will you see on it? What will you do and all that? And so it became a, a few years of, bigger models and now doing renderings of what you'd see inside. But at the same time, the space program had been, yeah, that was my very first little model. And it's not complete enough that you can see the Western. My hand is about where the Western River building, that might be it on that under my hand. Um, so Tony, this, this was initially for Florida. Yes. But then the space program, and you know, we're only like 50 miles from you know the Cape. Uh, you know, it was every day we're going to the moon, we're doing this, we're, you know, and we're doing a, an old fashioned 1880s train ride, you know, so <laughs> immediately they went back to Walt Disney's, um, the year before he died, they'd unveiled Space Mountain for Disneyland. And Florida said, we want that, that puts us in competition with Cape Kennedy. Uh, oh. 
And, you know, people will come here because we are offering a space thing that's even more exciting because you get to do it. And that's the Amazing. basic thing about thrill rides. Uh, you can try to say you're going to tell whatever story you want, but the story is what happens to me while I ride it, you know, that. Yeah. And when people work on that aspect of it, it becomes great. So you're launched into this flight through limitless space and uh, I couldn't compete. And so Big Thunder sadly went onto the shelf while they built the Florida Space Mountain, which opened in 76, I think. Five. Five, okay. And, oh, I set the dial wrong. That's right. Um, <laughs> and, but now the funny thing that happened is Disneyland felt like the, the, uh, the ugly stepsister, you know, Walt Disney World was getting a pirate ride. They were getting a space mountain and nothing was happening. And um, they had a problem with nature's wonderland. They'd already closed the mules and the stage coaches were closed years before that. And so the only thing was the train. And if it was out on its nine minute run uh, and they only ran one or two trains because nobody rode it, uh, there was nothing going on. The whole land was dead. You know, you just saw cute little buildings and an empty train station. So they said, is there any way you could readdress that attraction? I said, well, it's on the other side of the river. So just first off, we're gonna have to run all the drawings through the blueprint machine backwards to flip it, you know, because the staging in Florida is oh. over where the Haunted Mansion is at Disneyland oh, right. and it's over on Fantasyland side. So that worked okay. The only change was a segment in Florida we had done called the Flash Flood, which was actually designed to play to the park railroad. Disney World has nothing for the train ride around the park, whereas we have the dinosaurs and we have the, um, you know, the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided we'll give them the Flash Flood. <laughs> and so you become the stars of it when your train goes through that segment on Big Thunder and the track is twisted. So the vehicles are all going catawampus as they travel through there, like the roadbed is being undermined by the water. And so all the guests on the train are either looking at it saying, wow, I'm afraid to do that, or like, wow, we're coming back to go on that, you know? And so it became a show scene. In Disneyland, that's right up against Pinocchio Ride. Uh, they're like 25 feet apart. So we did Coyote Canyon where you dig the people down deep into a dark ravine so they can't see they're right next to the Pinocchio ride. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> hmm. So now we're getting to the point where, so Disneyland went ahead with that and it opened in 79. Uh, and now in 79, Walt Disney World's uh, Space Mountain was already four years old and uh they said we need it now we really need big thunder so uh skip lang who was my partner on building the models and everything he went down to florida and got the second one started while i stayed back here uh, and finished up disneyland in california so we had overlap on those two it was open i think in 81 80 or 81 in wow. florida and uh we had written a song uh that don john denver was going to open the ride in Disneyland and then there was a labor strike and his schedule was you know so we had this song the legend of thunder mountain um and it I think it debuted for the grand opening in Florida um there was a cast of thousands on the river so that was kind of the the first attraction that um I started from you know am I going to be left without a chair when yeah. the music stops and I think that the other thing that I was aware of for the first time in that was, you know, the remainder of the classic staff at Imagineering were people that Walt had hired because they were so talented and they could make his dreams come true. But he didn't hire people that had their own dreams. So they were dependent on someone generating ideas. And, you know, my humble little train ride, which was, again, like when I was a kid, I would have killed to have all the materials and machines and everything to build that, that we had in Imagineering. I couldn't afford it. So I was out in the model shop building this ride with just the thought of like, I'm getting to do the ultimate <laughs> train set, you know, yeah. and because I understood gravity. I was also one step ahead on the engineering. I built that model. And so I was really close on anticipating how far you could extend the track before it ran out of energy. So I found myself in a position where 
everyone wanted to get on the big thunder bandwagon. Can I help you with the drawings? Can I help you with the uh, engineering, whatever? And I, like I said, I'm now about 24, 25 and I've got all this stuff and I go, what's missing here at Disneyland or at, at Imagineering is Walt. Yeah. You know, that whole thing of like, okay, now we're going to do, I, Harriet would tell me when he came back from Switzerland and said, I've decided we're building a modern, a Matterhorn between, you know, Fantasyland and, and they would just look like the guy was crazy, you know, that <laughs> buy a Matterhorn of all things, it's going to be 100 square. So instead of 14,000 feet, it'll be 140, <laughs> all this stuff. And like, she said, oh, well, you know, and see, it's that, that, that job of like, Walt's taking the risk. Right. I get to build this incredible Matterhorn and it looks neat. And as a kid, I looked at it, I didn't question why is it there? It's just a very fun ride and it looks great. And uh, I'm very scared to ride it. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, all of a sudden I found like there wasn't anybody coming back from Switzerland saying, okay, we're going to do this or we're going to yeah. do that. And there was Epcot, with Walt left, but it was so overwhelming that the company wasn't you know secure enough i think to even entertain that we're going to build a city of tomorrow or anything like that yeah. so big thunder was a, a bite that was familiar it was we know how to do a roller coaster track we know how to do rock work um and uh it fills that space where there's a big hole in florida and it fills uh it replaces a ride that's no longer running at a capacity you know so yeah. um all of a sudden I realized, okay, my edge here is idea generation. You know, yeah. that's going to be my, my oh. thing. And uh, it wasn't something I marched in the door says, I want to be a ride designer and blah, blah, blah. No, you, you just suddenly realized I've got all the talents in the world here. And it, where it really hit home was on Discovery Bay, Harper Goff, who designed the Nautilus, he designed yeah. Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Yeah. Uh, the Vikings, you know, and the Ventureland and Main Street and the Golden Horseshoe. He came back for Epcot and they weren't ready yet. And he came by my desk and he saw Discovery Bay and he goes, is there any way that um, I could work with you on this? You know, <laughs> wow, with me, not for me, by the way, because I'm going, you're not going to work for me. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to bring to this that I would right. have a clue how to do? And when I said, of course, I mean, I, I, this is the best thing that's ever happened. He was actually so humble, you know, kind of uh -huh. in there and say, would you mind if I worked on it? And, and so <laughs> he generated these amazing drawings very quickly of wow. more rich detail and things for Discovery Bay. That, and, and I still have copies of those that are very precious you know to me because here was a genius and um so it was that kind of a uh, an opportunity of building teams of people that work with you yeah added brought something that you didn't do and you know when i look now at something like watching john williams the other night conduct um, the symphony orchestra at the indie thing um all those people are so skilled at each instrument but they couldn't write dun 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 dun, dun, right. dun, 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 dun. That's John Williams. So yeah. you know he couldn't play it. He'd sound like me going dun 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> when he goes like this, and you hear an eighty-piece symphony orchestra, the chills in your back. So yeah, that's kind of what it's all about: is somehow finding a way that you can work with people that all bring their contributions, which are more than what your contribution. Yeah. could do alone right and I, i've seen it both ways where somebody is very uh protective and not telling you what they're doing and not and only dishing out partials of little you work on this do that thing and bring it back to me mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it, it's only as good as that one person and not um you know bring the, the all the thoughts and possibilities that you get when you open when you're extroverted in terms of not being an extrovert, but being using um, input from others rather right. than using only your internal ideas, you know. So. Yeah. Well, it's being a visionary. I think Walt passed away in '66. You came yeah. in three or four years later. And yeah. Kind of had some of that same capability yeah. to envision yeah. things. Well, and they were all all the people that had done these things were there. Yeah. So exactly. Was, uh, and I was Roly Crump was there. Mark and 
you know, Albertino and Exitensio and wow. uh, Sam McKim. And, yeah. and, and that thing that I don't see so much now is that now that I'm in their position, nobody comes to me and says, you know, would you give me, I have three or four mentees, but uh, you know, in those days they had programs at Imagineering where you'd go right. in and you'd immerse in Mark Davis for an afternoon or Claude or Mary Blair. I wow. worked with Mary Blair on the Contemporary Hotel wow. and arranged her work. Yeah. Uh, and I remember I was, she asked me to do 500 chairs for the concourse, you know, and all the restaurants in there. And I started on a little Dremel saw cutting out, you know, these little chairs about that big. And somebody <laughs> came to my desk and said, What are you doing? And I said, Well, I've got to do 500 chairs. It's going to take forever. And he took me out to the carpenter shop and we cut an H shaped piece of long wood you know it was shaped like a, a lowercase h and about eight feet long and then we just went J -j 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 <laughs> and made little cuts of that uh, and had 500 chairs and you know you you don't come to the party knowing all that stuff that uh, right. seems so obvious yeah. but um those were things i learned so it was this being around people that um, brought you things you wouldn't ever think about. And then you brought things that gave them that enthusiasm yeah. to yeah. create, so. So Tony, you talked about Discovery Bay, Big Thunder, and coming up next in your career was imagination. Yes. And all these things, three things have in common is they are not based on a movie or TV show. Right. So right. if Joe and I were hired tomorrow to design a Big Thunder kind of coaster, you know, we'd be told you should find a movie or a yeah. TV show. So how do you feel about that whole book report well, versus, you know, I, I've, uh, I'd say I've enjoyed both, you know, yeah. it's, it's neither either, or I think where you've got to be careful is like Warner's in their early you know, getting into this, they would give like uh, Six Flags the rights to Batman right. and they'd slap a sign on the front that says Batman, the adventure. And then the front of the car would have bat wings on it or something. And it was a roller coaster. Right. right. Well, that's just dumb. And I don't really think anybody comes because of that. They come because of the coaster. Right. Um, and the other end of it is like Indiana Jones, where, uh, you know, that was like a gift from heaven, you know, like uh, if you did a fake one and I, I, I said we could save the you know, licensing fees uh, if we just did Kentucky Buck and the <laughs> you know, that would be free and you could use the same color graphics that would be free, uh, but the public would feel it's artificial it's, it, uh, you know, it's, it's not the real it's not genuine. Yeah. Indy is so ingrained in the culture he's a genuine article and so it has to have that dna it has to have john williams music it has to have uh drew strusen's poster you know yeah. because even the poster art as good as the new poster is the fact that drew wasn't able to do it uh you know there's something missing right there when you look at it that you don't get that <laughs> it's back and he's back um yeah. so you know all those things come together to make a good thing but big thunder and um and I think journey into imagination was again, evolutionary. I always start out. It's funny that you say, you know, we'd have to do a movie. I always think of a movie when I start out because it gives me something that gave me chills or goosebumps, you know, that I want to try and get into the ride, right. even if it isn't that. So like my evolution in Epcot was from the seas pavilion to the land pavilion to journey into imagination. So I had two literal worlds, seas and then land. And then, a world that's what is it you know yeah for starting in the seas my how do i you know how do we capture the the biggest um element natural element of earth and make it entertaining what do you do is it a movie you know that's boring i think <laughs> kind of it will be in a year or two after you've seen the movie three or four times because here's a here's a lesson i'll say it now but it's out of order but i'm thinking about it yeah. i always start to design thinking of the 20th ride and i'm waiting in line for an hour now for the 20th time why why <laughs> compelling enough to go back uh for 20 times it's really easy to do something that we go in like for a world's fair where the fair is going to be knocked down in six months and you've got three days at the fair you're not going to run out of steam on seeing that ride. But Peter Pan is now almost seven years old. And I can tell you while we're talking right now, there's almost an hour line at Disneyland to ride it. 
Yeah. Why? Yeah. What is it? What is aspirational in that? Right. So I always, when you have got the blank sheet of paper, how do you get something on it right away? So on C's, I went back to my childhood, you know, fanaticism with the Ten Commandments, and I thought about Moses standing on the rock and raising his hands and the oceans open in front of us. And I thought, well, that could be a Triton and Triton could be there. And we could do the biggest audiometronic this side of the Yeti that doesn't work. <laughs> and, uh, and he is angry at man for disturbing the oceans and not understanding the rhythms of the oceans. He said, the only, you know, the, so he says, the only way for you to see my world is to step inside it and see it from my perspective. And then, quoting Charlton Heston, stand back and behold the wonders of the sea. And then the Triton strikes out with all these bolts of lightning and the bubbling of this water in front of you and the audiometronic Neptune in the water. And it starts raising up and pulls apart. And then the entire theatrical audience walks through a causeway all out of the parting of the Red Sea out to ride vehicles that are on the other end of it. And you board from there. So once I had that in my mind, uh, it didn't matter whether it became Charlton Heston or it stayed Triton and he became the Triton in Little Mermaid, which hadn't been invented for another eight years. So it didn't matter. It was, I could feel the emotion of what yeah. it would be like to be in that theater and that I would wait 20 times for this moment as I have to hear him say after three hours of movie, Still, you do not believe. Stand back and behold. And that scene and the three women with their hair blowing and uh, the fingers of God come down in the ocean and then, you know, it pulls back. And DreamWorks even did better with that and the Prince of Egypt. Yeah. But um, so I was on my energy juices. I could see if we do this and I'm allowed to create that, I can see it'll be good. And then you start thinking, you turn it over to the automatronics people and they're saying, we could put uh, fin shaped um, um, fountain um, nozzles on all of Neptune's fins or Triton's fins so that when he got angered, they'd spray further. And you'd, so you'd have these fans that look like fish, um, you know, scales or not scales, but fins that would grow. So his mane of these, sprays of water would grow really big oh. when he was aggravated and they could come yeah. back down. So you, I saw it. So you, you start, the engineers give you something like that. So now my, my Triton is getting more exciting to me, you know? And so then we got the whole ride designed and it was very Fantasia-like. And there's, turns out there's nobody that's into oceanography that has multi-millions of dollars to spend on a pavilion. So, well, why don't you do the land? And then I went, okay, this whole that doesn't work the land is earth and it's humble and it's we rely on it for you know all of our resources come from the land so what am i going to find so go back into my you know ip box and there's a <laughs> very obscure film called the seven faces of dr lao oh, yeah. <laughs> where this little uh, Asian guy comes to a, a town where everybody is grumbling and fighting with one another and has bad uh, karma going on and one by one he gets them to see themselves in a different light uh -huh. and when he leaves nobody's the same they're all you know everything is solved and I said oh and there's a line at the end where each time you look at the earth that you hold in your hand you see a wonder um, and that is the circus of Dr. Lau and I went like goosebumps again so all right we've got to create a marvelous amazing character and I kind of rolled him into the idea of Professor Marvel from The Wizard of Oz. Again, someone who gets you to see uh, your shortcomings yeah. you know, and gets Dorothy to go back home uh, to see her aunt. So <clears throat> we developed this guy and um, I had that little dragon guy that Steve Kirk had uh, done for Discovery Bay. And so we had the old guy and we said, well, let's just throw the dragon thing in there. and. Um, so we, we needed a name, so we called him the Land Keeper. And the Land Keeper was going to take you on a journey to the future fair to see um, all the biomes of nature. And so we had a very ecological story for the land, which was way ahead of its time for 1982. Uh, that, that whole, you know, being better stewards for the land is not matured yet 
And so we yeah. thought we're really on the leading end. And we were working with the University of Arizona. And uh, Dr. Carl Hodges was convinced we could build these crystals that would use the byproduct energy of one another. So a hot space would in turn uh, provide energy for a cold space and vice versa. And he thought it could all be neutralized out. And um, so we went forward and presented that there'd be eight biomes and a ride that took you into the blueprints of nature and, and then deposited you at the top highest alpine biome. And then you'd walk your way down through these individually contained things where you experience heat, cold, humidity, and, and whatnot. And um, it was stunningly beautiful. And I remember General Modi saying, well, we don't want to be anywhere near that. And, and someone said, <laughs> why is it? A, he said, well, because we'd only get the byproducts of people that couldn't get into that one. And um, so that was brewing that it was too um, attractive, you know. And then the second thing was the only, we wanted like Georgia Pacific or uh, a lumber company that was trying to make sure their image was a little bit cleaner than what stripping the forests and all that was <laughs> happening at the time. And, yeah. uh, but the only money was craft foods who wanted to tell about producing foods, you know, and, and, and so the whole thing was aborted and, uh, I was taken off and I was very, um, hurt because, uh, everyone the pavilion was stunning in fact they even brought it out for the last d23 year yeah so i put it on display because it's just a spectacular model and a thing that i i was really trying to focus on there is if we use crystals that are based on a nature form uh, unlike most architecture they're not going to date because it's a form that's out of nature and so it should have the same validity that a, looking at a crystal today or back in the medieval times um, it's a crystal as a crystal. So I was very uh, excited about pursuing that. Anyway, when it ended, Carl Hodges, the last day uh, I saw him uh, on his way back to Arizona, he said, I'm going to build it, you know, and I thought, what, on a professor's salary at a state <laughs> university? And they did. It was called Biosphere 2. And oh. people lived inside of it for two years. And I think it's still open as a tourist attraction uh in arizona and it was quite quite a, a, a controversial thing actually for its time wow. so people were trapped in it and it was sealed and so they had to produce all their food and their air and everything yeah and, um, and it looked fairly attractive it wasn't quite as grandiose as our crystals but <laughs> pretty impressive so i was hum i was really feeling down and my partner on seas was kim murphy um who went on to be head of environmentality at Disney. And I would all, he was head of Marine Land at the time here in California. And I would go down there and cry in his office. <laughs> that is there anything you could do to just get yourself out of a really, you know, uncomfortable going to work and seeing all the excited people working with really, Roly Crump was given the, the land pavilion then. And all of the team that I'd worked with, they're all working with Roly and I'm, had nothing to do. Oh, so I went down to Disneyland and, uh, you know, so Skip could go to Florida on Big Thunder. And I, I did the Big Thunder here in California. Best thing I ever did. I went back to Kim and I said, oh my gosh. I said, every day, the excitement of seeing another 10 feet of rock work or the painting of the stalactites or the pools being tested, um, riding the ride, all of that. It was just an amazing thing my dad was still alive and he grew up near the sierras and his son is building a mountain at disneyland <laughs> that yeah. was the deal you know and so uh it was just really good and near the very end of it i got a call that kodak wanted to be involved in imagine in uh, well imagination but an epcot and it was way at the end of uh the planning and we were into construction and so they were at least a year behind and um uh, so they brought him in, pitched the, the seas pavilion, pitched space pavilion. And uh, they said, well, those are all fine and they're kind of natural worlds, but don't, you guys are about imagination. Isn't there something that you're going to do about imagination? And that was the click. And uh, I partnered with a guy named uh, Bob Gibbons from Kodak, who actually was more supportive in getting characters into that attraction than Disney was, because Epcot was going to be this very prestigious thing and they didn't right. want um 
you know, characters and Mickey and all that stuff. Uh, it's because it was trying to say a message. And uh, anyway, uh, we, I brought out my landkeeper and my little dragon. And I didn't say landkeeper. I said, well, this could be the dream finder. Yeah, right. and it's a little dragon, whatever. And they go, oh, that's it. Kodak took pictures of it and they published it in their house paper. And it was wow. Awful. And it was, they go, do you know these two characters? And they, and they said, you you don't, but you soon will. They will be taking you into a journey into the world of imagination. And Marty was wow. livid because you know <laughs> nothing goes out of that building without being scrutinized to death. Oh, right. We hadn't said yes. We hadn't done anything. But they were already convinced that this was where they were going. And so we only had one more, pro two problems. One, the little dragon was green and Kodak made it very clear since Fuji film was, their color was brown. Oh, right. They said, there's never going to be a, um, <laughs> a, a mascot for the Kodak company that's green. <laughs> and secondly, um, we didn't have a name. You know, there was no name. And uh, this is an old story, but for the 5% of people that haven't heard it, I was sitting watching TV and it was Magnum PI and the old butler was mad because the whole garden was being torn up or eaten by something. And Magnum had hidden a goat out there. And uh, so F Higgins, the butler is, you know, ragging on and, <clears throat> and Magnum just looks at him and says, oh, Higgins, it's just a figment of your imagination. And then uh, Higgins looks back at him and says, figments don't eat grass. And I sat there and it just stopped. The world stopped. And I said, <laughs> this is what I call uh, valuable mental real estate. Okay. Yeah. That word is not IP. It's right. free. You can, anyone can have it. It's absolutely right. free. And I said, and everybody thinks of it as a kind of an impish character. I mean, if you said, what is a figment? and you didn't know the purple dragon that we did, you'd say, oh, it's a, a funny little thing that plays tricks in your mind, you know, which is perfect. That's yeah. what it is, you know? And so yeah. I could hardly wait driving to work that day. I grabbed the statue, put it in there, and I said, meet Figment. And the whole, our whole team just sat there and said, where did that come from? <laughs> and I said, from Magnum P.I. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when, yes. If I had a nickel for every figment that's been sold, uh, I'd be, uh, I wouldn't have to worry <laughs> because it, it clicked. It was so, yeah, that was at Skip's Halloween party, uh, <laughs> the, the first one that we had made. And uh, I, I'm always um, embarrassed to dress up, but I didn't mind carrying figment around that day. <laughs> anyway. Who, who designed the character? Uh, it went, well, it started with Steve Kirk and then uh, it passed through the usual forces in Imagineering. I think the one who had the most two-dimensional impact was Exitensio. Oh. Then it was passed on to the sculpture department with Blaine Gibson. And um, so it went from, there was a snaggletooth quality that was really cute and snappy and everything in Steve Kirk's that moved very much into traditional Disney love, lovable, cuddly, you know, a figment that he became. And then we weren't going to go orange and yellow, which was Kodak box colors, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we went with purple and then luck would have it that Marty said, we're so busy with Epcot. If you know anyone in Hollywood that uh, is good and can work, bring them in. So I brought the Sherman brothers in. Yeah. And they fell in love with the story and they understood it right away, which was, you know, breaking down this amorphous topic into something that can be a spoonful of sugar. Yep. And, and we finally settled after writing script after script and all this stuff that you knew no one would you know get anything out of it um we settled on we all gather input which is what most of you are doing by turning into this session today and you're combining it with things that you already know uh and then you're going to create something new from what you maybe got out of today and the things that you bring to the table on your own so gather store and then recombine was very simple you know mm -hmm. and we figured if we keep to that and not try to go off into the weeds, like the show that's in there now, yeah. which features a toilet on the ceiling and the guests are brought into the pavilion and told they're not imaginative, then they smell a skunk, they hear a train and they see a toilet on the ceiling and then they're told you're now very imaginative and can go back out into the world. That ride has been there for two years longer than the ride that I'm describing. Wow. which had you gathering input with Dreamfinder and Figment in the only ride 
scene that could tell a story because you were actually married to a theater scene for three and a half minutes where explained who we were able to explain who the characters were, how Figment was created, yeah. where it came from. And then we're ready to be launched into a, a ride where we get to take the things we gathered and see them being stored and then recombine them into new things, all yeah. to this incredibly earwormy one little spark. Yeah. That's wrote. Yeah. So um, it was one of those marriage is made in heaven. We had a great sponsor. Kodak's theme was uh, America's Storyteller. Yeah. Uh, they weren't into selling film and, and boxes of cameras and all that. They were into letting human beings tell stories and become more imaginative. So, you know, we were, it was one of those gift things. So that's probably the best thing, example of creating the mythology uh, from scratch. Yeah having any borders there wasn't an ocean that ended at the seashore and there wasn't a land mass that ended at the ocean you know it was it was as big as your mind but the challenge with something that huge and amorphous is how do you narrow it down to something that everyone a child especially children and i know this for a fact the letters that we got from kids who's um came there maybe to see mickey and all of that but fell in love with figment uh, it would, some of them would break your heart, you know. It was yeah. Billy Barty, who did the voice, wrote to me and said, "I've worked in Hollywood since the '30s, and I've never had um, comments about the work I did that touched me as much wow. as what um, this this has done." You know, so wow. we just amazing. sometimes never think that you're creating a fun, crazy thing, but kids absorb into it and say, "That's." how I get out of this shell I'm trapped in. This is the way out into yeah. being a, a productive member of society. Wow. Well, I hope you get residuals for- uh... Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, and I'm going down there, there's gonna be a convention. So everybody go in September, uh, Journey into Imagination Revisited, Brian, Ooh. I can't his last name. Uh, it's guys that grew up as kids, probably in the 80s, and their parents took movies and stuff of them writing it. Yeah. And they live in the AI world. And so they've been able to take the VHS tapes and convert them to HD. And I was watching the live stream of it um, while I was up at the cabin. And I can only go to one spot where I get two bars and, and the streaming <laughs> kind of works, you know. Yeah. And I started tearing up because I, even on my little phone screen it looked like i was going on the ride and nothing has because filtered through vhs and lousy color and smear and all that you just never but they were they worked magic so i'm there texting and i i put my name on it i said this is tony baxter and i said you just made my entire year oh, wow. and the guy goes is this really the guy that did it i said <laughs> no but i'm not going to send you my contact <laughs> at, uh, at tom morris i don't know if tom is on this today but Tom uh, became the go-between. So I'm now going to go down and do a big presentation for them. In oh, that's September, great. October 1st, September 29, 30th. Wow, end. awesome. Yeah, so, so we're going to reconstruct re re -construct that original show wow. as best we can. So Tony, we you have so many great stories and so much wisdom to share that it turns out today is going to be part one of uh -oh. the Tony Baxter time machine <laughs> adventure because we have hit 94 minutes what? And over. <laughs> and i just turned the thing backwards here <laughs> and we're and only in 19 an hour and a half we, ha we haven't even gotten to new fantasy land in 93 so we have 40 more years to go and star tours and, <laughs> and, and, star and, tours and, and you have a joke and 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 even more wear my indie shirt for the occasion i know i know well, we have we have 25 minutes of Q&A. Do we want to do a few more minutes and then go to Q&A or whatever you Let's want to see. do? Let's see. What comes next after this? Um, we're New at Fantasyland, the Disney Gallery, and Star Tours. The, well, those are, I think Star Tours is the next, uh, is really a transformation thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Fantasyland was a chance to lovingly, you know, correct age and, and you know, uh, obsolescence that was building into that. I mean, we grew up with it, but kids that were in the 80s with faster media and all the stuff that was happening, video is in the homes and stuff now. And um, it was time, you know, to, and all we, all we kind of used as an excuse was that 
well, obviously loved the storybook villages that were in storybook land. So why don't we just try to, uh, now that we have enough money to build it full size, let's just take that, you know, and Ken Anderson was with us on that. Ken had designed storybook land and wow. was a licensed architect and an animator who designed characters and still completely um, with it in terms of, so Ken would sit there and sketch out the front of uh, the toad ride and it was model perfect to the original movie that he did back in the 40s you know wow. so uh, but Tom Morris and I uh, I remember the night they knocked it all down and we went down to see the demolition and uh, it was about five we got off work and we went down and we're wandering around and when it hit the time when the light signals would turn on the popcorn lights on all the buildings and everything boom the Fantasyland Theater had strands of lights that had been just torn off when we we're hanging in the dirt and everything, and they oh. pulled it up. Oh. And Tom and I looked at each other and said, "What have we done? Yeah. It's the heart of Disneyland, and it looks like a bomb went off here." You yeah. Know? yeah, and that was a sobering moment, you know. But then you realize we have so many skillful people you know, that paint rocks and carve rocks and, and age wood and, um, you know, design characters and everything. And so we all knew our mission was just to do a better one than before. And the one thing I threw in it to just make sure, even if we fail, we can't miss on this. We'll put 25% more track on every ride. Oh. And that was hard to figure out how do we add on to these buildings that are landlocked. But we did it. Every one of those rides is 25% longer than the original oh, open wow. day attraction. So, you know, I figured that's just where, my, where, the back of my mind, you know, so. Where did you get the real, like you said, you were landlocked. So yeah, where so did the, you get the there was a hat store? shop uh, between Toad and, and Peter Pan. That's the new uh, judges quarters and some of the hell in mm. Toad. And then we moved the front of Peter Pan out to put the big pirate ship in there. So that's out in the guest walkway, which oh, meant that wow. carousel had to go away. So the carousel moved back to where the teacups were. And the teacups moved over to where Alice was. And on Snow White, that was the hardest one. We took away the employee break area in the back to create the dwarf's mine. And then Pinocchio was brand new. So it right. enjoyed the luxury of being started from scratch. So, yeah. and Alice, we added, the uh, fan to uh, restaurant we nuked. And so the kitchen of that is now the uh, tea party uh, scene at the end of the ride. So oh, you can wow. go outside and then go back in, mm -hmm. which right. I, I love that idea because from a boy's standpoint, I'd all project, always project back to my childhood. That was kind of a, if, you, if your friends from school saw you riding that caterpillar down that leaf, that was not a cool thing to be, because <laughs> you just got out and that was the end. So we put, um, you go back into the building and then there's a big explosion at the end and then people come out. Right. So it became a little more macho than uh, the cutesy yeah. thing that it <laughs> wow. So anyway, from Fantasyland, then you, the Disney Gallery uh, was actually the beginning of Splash Mountain oh. because um, we had been approached by Dick Nunes to create a flume ride to rival Knott's Berry Farm, which that's the reason not to do a flume ride. Mm -hmm. uh, if they've got a good one, why would we do that? Right. And the second was nobody went to Critter Country, which was called Bear Country. Yeah. Uh, so it was, they had a plan that showed 2% of the guests are there, 30% Fantasyland, 30% um, Tomorrowland, and then the rest on Main Street and Adventureland, whatever, and 2% out at, you know, so, we need something out there that's a big weenie, as they call it, to get people yeah. at the furthest end. And then they were closing America Sinks. So I'm getting ahead on this story, but I'm just moving that dial on the time machine to 80s. Yeah. Because uh, we'll go back. So got into work that day and I said, what if we take the America Sinks figures, put them in a flume ride that's themed to the South, um, and we use the music and songs from the animation in Song of the South. And that gives us a big ride that's not like a log ride, it's more uh, genteel in the South. Um, and it'll be a 2000 an hour. Uh, so we now, so then the IEs get to work on this and go, okay, 2000 an hour, that means 
2,000 going out to Critter Country, 2,000 coming back. That's 4,000 people having to pass through New Orleans Square. The pirate ride is already totally congested and there's no way to get around it. So we got to tear out all the plants in New Orleans Square. All the planters, all the big trees have got to go in order to handle 4,000 people in transit. And I, I, being that I drove every day on the freeway, I said, haven't you ever heard of an overpass, underpass? <laughs> and theme park, somehow the rules are that they should be flat as a pancake for whatever, and which is boring. Yeah. So I did a little model and I figured out I could get people over that were in transit. And then the lower level would be static people waiting for pirates. And it looked like the numbers all worked out and it was great. So they approved it and we didn't have to take out any planters. And uh, so now we're halfway through and I was out there working on it one day and I went into the upstairs, which was Disneyland International, which was the headquarters for Tokyo Disneyland's staff. And it was spectacular because it was actually going to be Walt's uh, apartment when he yeah. passed away. And they'd installed the marble and the crystal chandeliers and the hand you know, cut carpeting and it was all there. And Jim Cora was now residing in it, uh, you know, for Disneyland International. And I looked at it, I thought the the providence of it being Walt's dream, and it's so beautiful. Uh, why can't the guests see this? And we can make kind of a museum and it's upstairs, so it's out of the flow. And so we had at that time, and we'll get into the management issues of Frank and Michael, Frank uh, Wells and Michael Eisner. So Frank yeah. was a real fan of Disneyland. He was there all the time and he was going to be there on a Saturday. So I said, I'm going to camp out in that that room and then you bring him up. Now, there weren't the stairways out front. We were in construction there and there was a little very discreet stairway in one of the, um, you know, the little, um, what do you call them? Not balconies, but courtyards. Yeah. So he comes up. And I just heard this, oh my God, what is this? You know, and he first thought they, that Jim Cora had done this excessive audio, uh, office, you know, to make, <laughs> you know, look like a palace in there. And no, 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 this was done for Walt Disney. But, you know, if you would give me the money to build two stairways on the front out of wrought iron to match everything, it would both embrace the new bridge, which could have had a, if it was left to its own, I think the bridge might have felt a little freeway like in relation to that facade of New Orleans. So I said, yeah. if it's got two welcoming stairways coming down on either side, uh, that'll give us the sense of a courtyard there for the queue of pirates and make the bridge feel like it's part of the design. And then Frank says, well, well why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we doing that? And I said, and then they can come up here and we'll do a art gallery. And he goes, that's fantastic. So what do we have to do? And I said, you have to put, the staff at the wrought iron company on three shifts, 24 hours a day for three weeks. And he goes, so, well, who needs to know? And I said, well, Carl Bongiorno at Imagineering is going to be a little upset because their goal was to say to me, we'll just put, uh, we'll put some concrete down there and put some bolts in it. So someday that magical someday will come back in and plus, um, you know, and that never happens, you know, and right. so, uh, he says, okay, fine. I call Carl Bajaro and tell him to, that uh, Frank has approved this. Well, of course, on Monday, the fireworks went off, you know, and my boss <laughs> said, you did what on Saturday? And, <laughs> and now we had, you know, crews going around the clock to make those two stairways. Well, see, I could never have gotten people up that rickety little wooden stairway in the, in the courtyard. So we had to have that as a means of safety and a lot of other things to get people up but it gave it a rarefied quality so that the shows we did in that gallery were extraordinary and they felt they brought a level of not just professionalism but artistry mm -hmm. and treated disney art as you would treat museum art for the first time mm -hmm. and of course now d23 and everything is more productized that but that was the first time that i really think that theme park art was um put on display as something wondrous. Yeah. So that was day and date with the fact that we were in the going out of business mode. And so we'll start here on the um, Star Tours and then we'll pick up with Star Tours on the. Okay. So companies going out of business. 
uh, we had Ray Watson, who was head of the Irvine company, running the company. And I knew that the animated films had kind of become babysitter properties for Disney. They were uh, the kind of things you'd send your kids to in the afternoon and then go shopping and pick them up at five o'clock. Uh, no, no, they weren't, everyone in the family was cherishingly going to Robin Hood or, you know, the Fox and the Hounds or Black Cauldron. And uh, so, you know, uh, we needed, you know, because Disneyland was infused. This gets to your question about the other side of the equation. The oldest thing that was brought to the park when it opened was Snow White, which was 18 years old when Disneyland opened. Right. We look at it as a, an antique, but it was less than Little Mermaid is to us today. It was that close in time frame. So here was a park that was built on renewing all the mythology that 50s kids grew up with, existing now in the 80s for people that their childhood was Star Wars, E.T. and, uh, um, you know, those those films, Indiana Jones. And um, if those memories weren't in this park, then this park would not be relevant to their growing up. It would not be the place they go to get goosebumps when they hear John Williams music or whatever. And so I went in Ron Miller before he left and, and um, um, uh, who I just say, Ray Watson replaced him. And he agreed that we would meet with George Lucas up on his on Ron's winery, the Silverado Vineyards, which Silverado is a Disney branded wine, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so we met there. It was a wonderful day. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Diane Disney, Walt's daughter, was serving the lunch. There were no wow. service <laughs> people. She just said, there's plenty more in the icebox if you guys need anything else. <laughs> I'm going in line behind me is George Lucas in front of me is Ron Miller and, and <laughs> Walt's daughter is serving that. So, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And uh, George said he thought of his products as number one in the industry for his world. And he thought of Disneyland as number one in the world for its industry. So he said, I see no reason why this isn't a perfect marriage. And so I go home. Ron Miller very quickly is out of the company. I present it now to Ray Watson. In the middle of me talking Star Tours, he says, excuse me, excuse me. You, what was that you said? R2, 3P something? Oh, and I said, oh yeah, you know, R2, D2, and you know, and uh, 3PO are the droids. And he goes, droids? What is, I, I don't know any of this, what is this? And I said, <laughs> well, they are like the two characters like from the Wizard of Oz, like Toto and the Tin Man in star wars for this generation and he goes oh i i guess i should see the films and i thought oh, no. oh well it turned out later he was there in a caretaker role which they didn't say to any of us as they were out scouting for who's going to run this company and uh of course the the day that changed my life was the day that uh, frank and michael came to imagineering on a saturday they came over on monday and said we know everything about the rest of this company and we make movies and we do television. We don't know anything about what a Imagineering is. So we are going to be here on Saturday. So between now and then get out everything that you have that you haven't been able to sell or whatever, because we want to go through it. Uh, so for me, that was Star Tours with R2D2 and 3PO, which Ray Watson <laughs> didn't have a clue and, uh, and then Splash Mountain. So, um, uh, they came around and Michael had a 14 year old, which was his son, Breck Eisner. Yeah. He said, you know, I have to admit, I'm not a theme park uh, affection auto. I will be as I get into this job, but my son lives and breathes them. So he's going to be my eyes and ears for what you show me today. And so I thought, oh, great. My career depends on a 14 year old. <laughs> and then I, I, I re, re thought that I said, of course that's your audience. I said, right. this is the best thing that's ever happened to you. So I just went away from the way you corporate speak, the thing like it's going to generate 2000 an hour and throughput and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. the price points will be, you know, all it threw that away and just said, you know, you're going to get to fly, you know, with Luke Skywalker on this thing and blah, blah, blah. And of course, Michael looks at Breck after the story was over and he goes, dad that's really cool let's do it you know he goes okay we're building that what else <laughs> the same thing for splash mountain thinking a 14 year old 
Brer Rabbit and Brer Fox, maybe he won't like that as much. So I just went tallest, steepest, biggest, you know, dip drop that in the dark, nobody's seen that. And uh, Brett goes, dad, that's even better than the Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're doing it. So we open that next year and this one the year after. And then the other side of the house comes in and says, no, 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 no. Star Tours will at least take three years and, and Splash probably five, which I think it came out to being two and four, but uh, Michael was furious and said, all right, I can't tell you how to do your business. I don't understand it yet, but I know how to make movies. So he looks and he says, Frank, who's the hottest pop star right now? And Frank says, Michael Jackson. He goes, great, get Michael Jackson, get Coppola, get Lucas, <laughs> and have them over here next week. And then he looked back at us and he said, we are going to have a film opened in this park that shakes Disney up and sets a whole new course and direction oh. for the company. Wow. And, uh, and don't tell me we can't do it because we make movies. <laughs> so wow. That is a, probably a good stopping point. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a cliffhanger. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Except you all know what happened. <laughs> well, Tony, thank you so much. Hopefully oh my you have no plans you, for uh, Friday, July 21st because uh, that's our next Zoom cast. If that doesn't work, we'll have you back in September. But um so amazing these are great stories great wisdom just amazing stuff joe any uh any final words did Where you want to what uh, did you want to do any q a or did i yeah, eat up yeah we're gonna we're gonna first we're gonna end the show and then we'll come back and do a q a okay so joe and i are gonna joe do you have your goggles we're gonna you you mentioned Camelot. I'm actually oh, I love Camelot. Let's go to Camelot. I'm actually going I've got, to uh, Excalibur here. Oh, uh, oh my perfect. god! I still got Richard Harris's prints on it. So wow. let's I'm like go away at the end of the film. Let's run, boy, run. The original. Wow. Thing. All Keep right. The memories alive. You know? well, let's head off. Yeah. So everybody, I've got to find my thing here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Thank we'll you. See you with yeah. Tony thank Max you, everybody, for hanging on. <laughs> Tony, thank you. Look forward to hearing part two for sure. Okay. Bye, guys. Oh, my goodness. Well, we certainly hope you enjoyed the ride today. Thank you so much to our dear friend and mentor, Tony Baxter, for time traveling with us today. Uh, and if you have questions, please stick around. We're going to do a Q&A just after we end here. So on behalf of Zeitgeist Design and Production, we thank you for spending over 90 minutes of your day with us on the Spirit of the Time Zoomcast. If you enjoyed the journey, please check out all 25 of our time travel adventures on our YouTube channel or under the Zoomcast section at zeitgeist-usa.com. They're also available as podcasts wherever you listen. And uh, watch your email for an announcement of our next industry icon, which will probably be Tony Baxter part two. Fingers crossed. And until then, may your tomorrow have the nostalgia of the past, the wonder of the present, and the promise of the future. Stick around, and we'll be right back. Get it.